Section 27 of Inca Lands. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by William Tomko. Inca Lands by Hiram Bingham. Chapter 17. Machu Picchu. It was in July 1911 that we first entered that marvelous canyon of the Urubamba, where the river escapes from the cold regions near Cusco by tearing its way through gigantic mountains of granite. From Torontoy to Colpani, the road runs through a land of matchless charm. It has the majestic grandeur of the Canadian Rockies, as well as the startling beauty of the Nuuanu Pali near Honolulu and the enchanting vistas of the Ko'olau Ditch Trail on Maui. In the variety of its charms and the power of its spell, I know of no place in the world which can compare with it. Not only has it great snow peaks looming above the clouds more than two miles overhead, gigantic precipices of many-colored granite rising sheer for thousands of feet above the foaming, glistening, roaring rapids, it has also in striking contrast orchids and tree ferns the delectable beauty of luxurious vegetation and the mysterious witchery of the jungle one is drawn irresistibly onward by ever-recurring surprises through a deep winding gorge turning and twisting past overhanging cliffs of incredible height above all there is the fascination of finding here and there under the swaying vines or perched on top of a beetling crag the rugged masonry of a bygone race and of trying to understand the bewildering romance of the ancient builders who ages ago sought refuge in a region which appears to have been expressly designed by nature as a sanctuary for the oppressed a place where they might fearlessly and patiently give expression to their passion for walls of enduring beauty space forbids any attempt to describe in detail the constantly changing panorama the rank tropical foliage the countless terraces the towering cliffs the glaciers peeping out between the clouds we had camped at a place near the river called mandor pampa Melchor Arteaga, proprietor of the neighboring farm, had told us of ruins at Machu Picchu, as was related in Chapter 10. The morning of July 24th dawned in a cold drizzle. Arteaga shivered and seemed inclined to stay in his hut. I offered to pay him well if he would show me the ruins. He demurred and said it was too hard a climb for such a wet day. When he found that we were willing to pay him a soul, three or four times the ordinary daily wage in this vicinity, he finally agreed to guide us to the ruins. No one supposed that they would be particularly interesting. Accompanied by Sergeant Carrasco, I left camp at ten o'clock and went some distance upstream. On the road, we passed a venomous snake which recently had been killed. This region has an unpleasant notoriety for being the favorite haunt of vipers. The lance-headed, or yellow viper, commonly known as the fer de lance, a very venomous serpent capable of making considerable springs when in pursuit of its prey, is common hereabouts. Later, two of our mules died from snake-bite. After a walk of three-quarters of an hour, the guide left the main road and plunged down through the jungle to the bank of the river. Here there was a primitive bridge which crossed the roaring rapids at its narrowest part, where the stream was forced to flow between two great boulders. The bridge was made of half a dozen very slender logs, some of which were not long enough to span the distance between the boulders. They had been spliced and lashed together with vines. Arteaga and Carrasco took off their shoes and crept gingerly across, using their somewhat prehensile toes to keep from slipping. It was obvious that no one could have lived for an instant in the rapids, but would immediately have been dashed to pieces against granite boulders. I am frank to confess that I got down on hands and knees and crawled across six inches at a time. Even after we reached the other side, I could not help wondering what would happen to the bridge if a particularly heavy shower should fall in the valley above. A light rain had fallen during the night. The river had risen so that the bridge was already threatened by the foaming rapids. 
It would not take much more rain to wash away the bridge entirely. If this should happen during the day, it might be very awkward. As a matter of fact, it did happen a few days later, and the next explorers to attempt to cross the river at this point found only one slender log remaining. Leaving the stream, we struggled up the bank through a dense jungle, and in a few minutes reached the bottom of a precipitous slope. For an hour and twenty minutes we had a hard climb. A good part of the distance we went on all fours, sometimes hanging on by the tips of our fingers. Here and there a primitive ladder made from the roughly hewn trunk of a small tree was placed in such a way as to help one over what might otherwise have proved to be an impassable cliff. In another place the slope was covered with slippery grass where it was hard to find either handholds or footholds. The guide said that there were lots of snakes here. The humidity was great, the heat was excessive, and we were not in training. Shortly after noon, we reached a little grass-covered hut where several good-natured Indians, pleasantly surprised at our unexpected arrival, welcomed us with dripping gourds full of cool, delicious water. Then they set before us a few cooked sweet potatoes, called here kumara, a Quichau word identical with the Polynesian kumala, as has been pointed out by Mr. Cook. Apart from the wonderful view of the canyon, all we could see from our cool shelter was a couple of small grass huts and a few ancient stone-faced terraces. Two pleasant Indian farmers, Ricarte and Alvarez, had chosen this eagle's nest for their home. They said they had found plenty of terraces here on which to grow their crops, and they were usually free from undesirable visitors. They did not speak Spanish, but through Sergeant Carrasco I learned that there were more ruins a little farther along. In this country, one never can tell whether such a report is worthy of credence. He may have been lying is a good footnote to affix to all hearsay evidence. Accordingly, I was not unduly excited, nor in a great hurry to move. The heat was still great, the water from the Indian spring was cool and delicious, and the rustic wooden bench hospitably covered immediately after my arrival with a soft woolen poncho seemed most comfortable. Furthermore, the view was simply enchanting. Tremendous green precipices fell away to the white rapids of the Urubamba below. Immediately in front, on the north side of the valley, was a great granite cliff rising 2,000 feet sheer. To the left, was the solitary peak of Huayna Picchu, surrounded by seemingly inaccessible precipices. On all sides were rocky cliffs. Beyond them, cloud-capped mountains rose thousands of feet above us. The Indians said there were two paths to the outside world. Of one we had already had a taste. The other, they said, was more difficult. A perilous path down the face of a rocky precipice on the other side of the ridge. It was their only means of egress in the wet season, when the bridge over which we had come could not be maintained. I was not surprised to learn that they went away from home only about once a month. Ricarte told us that they had been living here four years. It seems probable that, owing to its inaccessibility, the canyon had been unoccupied for several centuries. But with the completion of the new government road, settlers began once more to occupy this region. In time, somebody clambered up the precipices and found on the slopes of Machu Picchu, at an elevation of 9,000 feet above the sea, an abundance of rich soil conveniently situated on artificial terraces in a fine climate. Here, the Indians had finally cleared off some ruins, burnt over a few terraces, and planted crops of maize, sweet and white potatoes, sugar cane, beans, peppers, tree tomatoes, and gooseberries. At first, they appropriated some of the ancient houses and replaced the roofs of wood and thatch. They found, however, that there were neither springs nor wells near the ancient buildings. An ancient aqueduct, which had once brought a tiny stream to the citadel, had long since disappeared beneath the forest, filled with earth washed from the upper terraces. So, abandoning the shelter of the ruins, the Indians were now enjoying the convenience of living near some springs in roughly built thatched huts of their own design. 
without the slightest expectation of finding anything more interesting than the stone-faced terraces of which i already had a glimpse and the ruins of two or three stone houses such as we had encountered at various places on the road between olantaytambo and torontoy i finally left the cool shade of the pleasant little hut and climbed farther up the ridge and around a slight promontory Arteaga had been here once before, and decided to rest and gossip with Ricarte and Alvarez in the hut. They sent a small boy with me as a guide. Hardly had we rounded the promontory when the character of the stonework began to improve. A flight of beautifully constructed terraces, each two hundred yards long and ten feet high, had then recently rescued from the jungle by the Indians. A forest of large trees had been chopped down and burned over to make a clearing for agricultural purposes. Crossing these terraces, I entered the untouched forest beyond and suddenly found myself in a maze of beautiful granite houses. They were covered with trees and moss and the growth of centuries. But in the dense shadow, hiding in bamboo thickets and tangled vines, could be seen, here and there, walls of white granite ashlars, most carefully cut and exquisitely fitted together. Buildings with windows were frequent. Here at least was a place far from town, and conspicuous for its windows. Under a carved rock, the little boy showed me a cave, beautifully lined with the finest cut stone. It was evidently intended to be a royal mausoleum. On top of this particular boulder, a semicircular building had been constructed. The wall followed the natural curvature of the rock, and was keyed to it by one of the finest examples of masonry I have ever seen. This beautiful wall, made of carefully matched ashlars of pure white granite, especially selected for its fine grain, was the work of a master artist. The interior surface of the wall was broken by niches and square stone pegs. The exterior surface was perfectly simple and unadorned. The lower courses of particularly large ashlars gave it a look of solidity. The upper courses, diminishing in size toward the top, lent grace and delicacy to the structure. The flowing lines, the symmetrical arrangement of the ashlars, and the gradual gradation of the courses combined to produce a wonderful effect, softer and more pleasing than that of the marble temples of the old world. Owing to the absence of mortar, there are no ugly spaces between the rocks. They might have grown together. The elusive beauty of this chaste, undecorated surface seems to me to be due to the fact that the wall was built under the eye of a master mason who knew not the straight edge, the plum rule, or the square. He had no instruments of precision, so he had to depend on his eye. He had a good eye, an artistic eye, an eye for symmetry and beauty of form. His product received none of the harshness of mechanical and mathematical accuracy. The apparently rectangular blocks are not really rectangular. The apparently straight lines of the courses are not actually straight in the exact sense of that term. To my astonishment, I saw that this wall and its adjoining semicircular temple over the cave were as fine as the finest stonework in the far-famed Temple of the Sun in Cusco. Surprise followed surprise in bewildering succession. I climbed a marvelous great stairway of large granite blocks, walked along a pampa where the Indians had a small vegetable garden, and came into a little clearing. Here were the ruins of two of the finest structures I have ever seen in Peru. Not only were they made of selected blocks of beautifully grained white granite, their walls contained asters of cyclopean size, ten feet in length and higher than a man. The sight held me spellbound. Each building had only three walls and was entirely open on the side toward the clearing. The principal temple was lined with exquisitely made niches, five high up at each end, and seven on the back wall. There were seven courses of ashlars in the end walls. Under the seven rear niches was a rectangular block, fourteen feet long, probably a sacrificial altar. The building did not look as though it had ever had a roof. The top course of beautifully smooth ashlars was not intended to be covered. The other temple is on the east side of the Pampa. I called it the Temple of the Three Windows. 
Like its neighbor, it is unique among Inca ruins. Its eastern wall, overlooking the citadel, is a massive stone framework for three conspicuously large windows, obviously too large to serve any useful purpose, yet most beautifully made with the greatest care and solidity. This was clearly a ceremonial edifice of peculiar significance. Nowhere else in Peru, so far as I know, is there a similar structure conspicuous as a masonry wall with three windows. These ruins have no other name than that of the mountain on the slopes of which they are located. Had this place been occupied uninterruptedly, like Cusco and Olentaytambo, Machu Picchu would have retained its ancient name. But during the centuries when it was abandoned, its name was lost. Examination showed that it was essentially a fortified place, a remote fastness protected by natural bulwarks, of which man took advantage to create the most impregnable stronghold in the Andes. Our subsequent excavations and the clearing, made in 1912, to be described in a subsequent volume, has shown that this was the chief place in Huilcapampa. It did not take an expert to realize, from the glimpse of Machu Picchu on that rainy day in July 1911, when Sergeant Carrasco and I first saw it, that here were most extraordinary and interesting ruins. Although the ridge had been partly cleared by the Indians for their fields of maize, so much of it was still underneath a thick jungle growth, some walls were actually supporting trees ten and twelve inches in diameter, that it was impossible to determine just what would be found here. As soon as I could get hold of Mr. Tucker, who was assisting Mr. Hedrickson and Mr. Lanius, who had gone down the Urubamba with Dr. Bowman, I asked them to make a map of the ruins. I knew it would be a difficult undertaking, and that it was essential for Mr. Tucker to join me in Arequipa not later than the 1st of October for the ascent of Coropuna. With the hearty aid of Ricarte and Alvarez, the surveyors did better than I expected. In the ten days, while they were at the ruins, they were able to secure data from which Mr. Tucker afterwards prepared a map, which told better than could any words of mine the importance of this site and the necessity for further investigation. With the possible exception of one mining prospector, no one in Cusco had seen the ruins of Machu Picchu or appreciated their importance. No one had any realization of what an extraordinary place lay on top of the ridge. It had never been visited by any of the planters of the lower Urubamba Valley, who annually passed over the road which winds through the canyon two thousand feet below. It seems incredible that this citadel, less than three days' journey from Cusco, should have remained so long undescribed by travelers and comparatively unknown even to the Peruvians themselves. If the conquistadores ever saw this wonderful place, some reference to it surely would have been made. Yet nothing can be found which clearly refers to the ruins of Machu Picchu. Just when it was first seen by a Spanish-speaking person is uncertain. When the county Sartiges was at Huadquina in 1834, he was looking for ruins. Yet, although so near, he heard of none here. From a crude scrawl on the walls of one of the finest buildings, we learned that the ruins were visited in 1902 by Lizarraga, lessee of the lands immediately below the bridge of San Miguel. This is the earliest local record. Yet, someone must have visited Machu Picchu long before that, because in 1875, as has been said, the French explorer Charles Wiener heard in Olentaytambo of there being ruins at Huayna Picchu, or Macho Picchu. He tried to find them. That he failed was due to there being no road through the canyon of Torontoy and the necessity of making a wide detour through the pass of Panticala and the Lucumayo Valley, a route which brought him to the Urubamba River at the bridge of Chuquichaca, 25 miles below Machu Picchu. It was not until 1890 that the Peruvian government, 
recognizing the need of the enterprising planters who were opening up the lower valley of the urubamba decided to construct a mule trail along the banks of the river through the grand canyon to enable the much desired coca and aguardiente to be shipped from Huadiquina, maranura and santa anne to cusco more quickly and cheaply than formerly this road avoids the necessity of carrying the precious cargoes over the dangerous snowy passes of Mount Veronica and Mount Salcante, so vividly described by Raimondi, de Sartiges, and others. The road, however, was very expensive, took years to build, and still requires frequent repair. In fact, even Today, travel over it is often suspended for several days or weeks at a time, following some tremendous avalanche. Yet it was this new road which had led Melchor Arteaga to build his hut near the arable land at Mandor Pampa, where he could raise food for his family and offer rough shelter to passing travelers. It was this new road which brought Ricarte Alvarez and their enterprising friends into this little-known region, gave them the opportunity of occupying the ancient terraces of Machu Picchu, which had lain fallow for centuries, encouraged them to keep open a passable trail over the precipices, and made it feasible for us to reach the ruins. It was this new road which offered us, in 1911, a virgin field between Olente Tambo and Huadquina, and enabled us to learn that the Incas, or their predecessors, had once lived here in the remote fastnesses of the Andes, and had left stone witnesses of the magnificence and beauty of their ancient civilizations, more interesting and extensive than any which have been found since the days of the Spanish conquest of Peru. End of section 27. Recording by William Tomko.